This podcast is brought to you by LTASex.com. Live, laugh, love, LTA Sex. Welcome to Behind Closed Doors, the podcast where we teach you what it really takes to have a perfect relationship. I'm your host, Jerome Stewart Nichols, sex educator and creator of LTSX.com. You know, those glossy Instagram selfies look great, but they don't tell the whole story. There's a hell of a lot that goes on behind closed doors that make strong, healthy, and sexually satisfying relationships. From the basics of communication and fighting fair, to full-time DS relationships and navigating the politics of polyamory, Behind Closed Doors offers you the expert advice and first-hand experience you need to get and maintain the relationship that's right for you. To keep up with the show, visit ltasex.com slash Behind Closed Doors for links to everything regarding the show. Subscribe to Behind Closed Doors on iTunes or Stitcher. You can keep up with me on Twitter at NotJeromeStewart or on Tumblr at ltasex.tumblr.com. Oh, and as always, if you have questions you want to answer or have some feedback about the show, uh, send it to me, Jerome at LTASX.info, J-E-R-O-M-E at L-T-A-S-E-X dot I-N-F-O. But enough of this shilling bullshit, let's get into the sex and relationships. Well, uh, hello all. How are you doing today? Welcome to another episode of Behind Closed Doors. I'm your host, as you know, Jerome Stuart Nichols. <laughs> you know, I had 16 seconds into this podcast and I'm already giggly. Um, I guess that's a good sign, I suppose. Um, this episode today uh, is featuring uh, Alicia, the sexual intellectual, previously of raw sex and now of a new book that she's writing. Uh, on this episode, we talked to her today about uh, lichen sclerosis, uh, otherwise known as LS. Uh, it's an autoimmune disease that makes your vagina dis- or I'm sorry, your vulva disappear. It's a, a strange disease that one that many people have never heard of before, but um, it, it's one that definitely needs to be talked about. I'll, I'll say that that for absolute certain. Um, in this episode, although lichen sclerosis itself is not uh, not so common, it, we also talk about many universal ideas uh, when it comes to something like this that uh, essentially destroys your genitals uh, over time. It, getting something like this, it, it's very common to uh, the feeling, say, someone might get from catching HIV or uh, something else that might... Uh, change how they view themselves. Now, I, I think it's important to talk about these topics because in relationships, shit happens. And one of the things that happens a lot because we're in bodies that require maintenance and that do things that we don't always want them to do uh, is talking about diseases and health and chronic illnesses that can uh, really affect how we live our lives, how we experience our lives, the type of sex that we can have, the type of sex that we enjoy, all, all these sorts of things that really make huge changes in the way we live our lives. Now, LS in particular uh, is is one that's a bit more uh, it's in the same vein of uh, say a diabetes where your body's just attacking itself uh, but there are lots of other diseases where your body is being attacked and some of them can lead to death and some of them can lead to like permanent disfigurement or illness and, and these are all things that we really need to talk about because in the long term every now and then we're going to come we're going to come to a point where the people we love are going to be sick. As you guys know, um, in my relationship, I've been dealing with, you know, my anxiety and depression, which is chronic. Uh, and then we've also been dealing with Bubby's amnesia, uh, his uh, his borderline personality disorder, his depression, his anxiety, his problems uh, maintaining his emotions or controlling his emotions. And it's not something that you can see physically, but it is something that needs to have a plan it's something that we can all sort of 
rally around, I guess. I, I, I don't know how I want to say it, but it's it's something that we absolutely... It's a part of the human experience, let's say that. And although it can be scary and it can be wild, which is part of what makes it so doggone scary, these diseases are just a part of life. And if you wake up tomorrow and your vulva is vanishing, uh, then you still deserve love. And if you wake up tomorrow and you remember all the bad things that happened to you as a child and you now have PTSD, you still need love. And in this episode, we're going to explore how to live and love and laugh, as the LTA sex tagline goes, um, in these situations medically. Uh, whether it's a physical deformity or, you know, an internal sickness or an invisible illness altogether. We want to make sure that you're capable and uh, there to experience that and be the person with it uh, in the relationship. And also uh, for the people who are loving people with these diseases or these illnesses, uh, we wanted to make sure that you had a bit of information about that as well. So, uh, I did the bamboo. bamboo. Those weren't words. I was scatting. I feel like I need to go back to like 1920s jazz club, and I'd probably have a hit record right now. Mm. That's a very good Heineken. Anyways, um, so before we get into the show, as always, if you guys want to support the show and you want to keep the show going, uh, please uh, consider donating on Patreon, patreon.com slash keep it sexy. Uh, One dollar pledged a month m- makes a huge difference for us here at LTA Sucks and us, you know, me, my partner and my copy editor. Uh, none of us are getting paid right now, but we do this because we love it and we believe in I guess we believe in my vision, which I guess I'd never thought of it like that before, but it's a, it's true. We sort of believe in this vision of, uh, making the world a sexier, healthier, more loving place. And your support allows us to keep that going. Patreon.com slash keep it sexy. Oh, and of course, oh my goodness. I can't believe I, Jesus Christ. Okay. So during the recording of this episode, I was having troubles with trouble with my internet, uh, my router, and my uh, whatever bullshit. It slow as fuck is just all you need to know, really. <laughs> yeah, so it was slow as fuck. Um, we had a bit of trouble uh, keeping the flow of conversation going. Although listening back to it, Google actually, or we use Google Plus to record these episodes. Google Plus actually got a lot of the conversation that we thought we were missing just because we couldn't hear each other. But Google was getting it, uh, so that's fine, I guess. But <clears throat> you'll hear, uh, unlike a lot of episodes that just sort of flow, you'll hear a little bit of cutting. Every now and then, uh, I try to keep it as clean as possible. Uh, uh, clean, you know, not re- not referring to vulgarity, for fuck's sake. We don't do that shit here. God damn it, Kathleen. But I did want to try, try to keep the show uh, as clean, as um, invisibly cut as possible. Uh, my apologies for any discomfort you may have with that but uh it is what it is we had to make we had to make the best out of what we had and it actually turned out that we had a you know over 40 minute episode that was jam-packed with bomb ass information so if you would like to catch up with alicia beth hiv testing counselor sex educator and former host of raw sex radio you can do that at rawsexradio.com you can also do that at save the vulva.weebly.com uh, she's also on Facebook at facebook.com slash raw sex RI, Twitter at raw sex RI, and at save the vulva. And she's on Instagram at Alicia Beth Educator. And there's underscores in between those three words. So it's Alicia underscore Beth underscore Educator. Uh, and as always, you can keep up with me at LTA Uh Thanks so much for your time. Now, 
as always, let's get into the sex and relationships. I'm using uh, notes from like us talking on Messenger. <laughs> That's awesome because I barely remember that conversation. So you're gonna say a lot of things that'll refresh my memory. Well, yeah, like I, like w- what I'm mainly using is like a guide is the like little synopsis. Um, because I feel like, yeah, there it is. Okay, so it, I said we should start with the book, right? And then the disease that's covered in the book, and then move into topics like unconditional love love through new disabilities, loving people as they need to be loved, all that sort of stuff. So I have those notes. Okay, cool. So I say, uh, I say you tell me about your book. Like, how did you actually get started writing a book? Because I want to write a book really badly. So um, I actually have a friend who is an editor. Mm-hmm. and he has produced uh, or edited some of his own um, works, and he recently put out a really popular book um, in the sex ed field, the sex ed community, and I have the book around me somewhere because I can't think of the name right at this exact moment. I have a trillion sex ed books. All right, best sex writing of the year and it's volume one. And so, um, well, John Presick is his name. And what he did was he just on the show. Has he? Yeah. All right. Well, John Presick is essentially the inspiration behind me writing this book. Um, through social media, we became really great friends and he's become a very, um, big influence in my career and in the field. And so one day we started talking and he, um, we've always kind of touched base about me writing a book because I've always wanted to do um, kind of like the story of my life and little details and things. And then, um, so I, I, I don't know how to transition into it so that way people can follow along. Um, so feel free to guide me. But so a few years ago I was diagnosed with uh, what they call lichen sclerosis. Okay. Um, it's a rare autoimmune disease. Um, it primarily affects the genital area being the vulva, um, or the anus and, uh, sometimes the penis. It's occurs more frequently in women after menopause. Um, but it does affect men. It does affect, uh, children. And so I was diagnosed about, I don't even know, three, four years ago. Um, so of course the way it is with most um, illnesses, you know, you go through a period of denial and you're freaked out and you're upset and there's a lot of emotions. And um, so I kind of just let it sit on the back burner for a long time. And then recently, probably, I don't know, in the last six to eight months, I decided to become more proactive about it. And so I started joining a lot of Facebook groups um, and just meeting people and Googling and websites and Twitters and um, doctors. And, I started seeing that there really wasn't a lot out there um, probably because a uh, not a lot of people are actually diagnosed properly with lichen sclerosis. It is one of those diseases that goes misdiagnosed very frequently. Um, But B it, it affects the genital area, which, you know, as much as we want to say America is like this super modern um, with it country, Sex is really, really taboo, and especially if it's something that can be viewed in a negative way. Um, All sex in America is viewed in a negative way. (laughs) Well, I guess you're right with that. Um, But when it has to do with the female body, and and I'll get more into it as we kind of discuss the details of of what lichen sclerosis is and how it affects the body uh, directly, but um, a lot of women... Well, what is it? So lichen sclerosis, it's... It causes the body um, or the skin or the tissue around the vulva to fuse. Um, A lot of times it's really hard to explain without visuals, but I don't advise folks to go and Google it because some of the Google images can be um, kind of triggering um, and and very emotional for a lot of folks. Uh, So the the tissue around the vulva kind of gets... Right. I know, but that's always like people's first resource, which is a terrible idea. 
Um, and so this, the skin or the tissue around the vulva kind of gets thin or white and patchy. I mean, the, the white patches can occur in other spots um, on the body, sometimes under the breasts, um, around the mouth area, very randomly. Um, but the tissue gets really, really thin. And so what happens is that tissue then breaks and there's a lot of trauma to the area and then it refuses and it breaks again. Um, so there's a lot of sensitivity with the skin around the genital area. There is a lot of um, long-term damage that can occur. And so ultimately there is no cure for it. Um, there are some treatments. Treatments are still kind of in the testing out phase. Um, some doctors are doing some amazing things with, um, now I can't think of the term, so I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, and so, so there are, are doctors taking progressive moves to, to try new things, um, but nothing is really guaranteed at this point. They're, they still can't figure out what exactly triggers the disease. Um, I've tried to come up with my own conclusions just by asking other folks who have been diagnosed. Um, it's definitely <clears throat> hormonal related, um, but different things trigger different flare-ups for people. Um, people go through different experiences. It progresses on the body differently for different folks. So for some folks, essentially, the vulva completely just disappears. It fuses all together, so it's one uh, layer um, instead of having, you know, the labia majora, the labia minora, it is all just one, um, one piece. And so that okay. of course can affect, it can that, affect folks in a variety of ways. Okay. That, that I was kind of confused about how it actually worked. Cause initially I was thinking that like the labia, uh, that are parallel to each other would fuse closing up the vaginal, uh, entrance, but that's, does that happen? So that, that does occur as well. And so what's kind of tricky about this disease in particular is, again, that it affects everybody really differently. So for some folks, they may have the white spots and that's it, right? For some folks, they may lose um, a portion of their inner labia um, and they call that labia flattening and that's it. For some people, the vulva completely vanishes and so it becomes difficult sometimes. It's it affects people um, that the fused skin kind of entombs the clitoris. Oh. Um, and so it's it's very painful when people get aroused. Um, and so it, I was just kind of going through the process of how it can affect folks differently. Um, and so then I was saying I should preface the conversation by saying that a lot of times when I talk about lichen, I talk very specifically to my situation, and my situation is very, very different from every other person who has been diagnosed. Um, there are some similarities in what prompts us to get um, to an OBGYN or a specialist. There are a lot of similarities in what triggers a, a, a lichen sclerosis flare up, um, but the actual progression of the disease um, and how it affects people it just varies so, so, so much. Okay. So can you, or do you feel comfortable talking about your particular kind? What is it? Do you feel uh, comfortable talking about your particular kind? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can go through the process for me um, in a quick you know, it's not a pretty picture, so I try to make a lot of jokes and make light of it um, because it makes it easier for people to listen to the types of conversation and have these types of conversations. Um, it can be a bit of a heavy topic. Um, but for me, I just, I started, you know, I was in my early to mid 20s and I'm a very sexual person and I started noticing things that were occurring um, when I was having, you know, casual sex. And I started to notice that I was getting a lot of yeast infections, reoccurring yeast infections. And so I went to my regular OBGYN. I was like, what in the hell is happening? This is ridiculous. I cannot have a yeast infection every time I have sex. And she was like, well, you have diabetes. So you're prone to yeast infections. Here's some Diflucan, have a good day. And I was like, okay, sure. And I stuck with it for a little while. And I was like, you know what? I am sick of you brushing me off. I know this is not it. I am going to a different OBGYN. So I moved practices completely. And that doctor started with the same shit. She was like, hey, you know, you're a diabetic. 
um, you're prone to yeast infections. Here's some Diflucan and have a good day. And I was like, okay, this is ridiculous. Um, I am have had a vagina for the last, you know, 20 something years. I know how it works. Something is very wrong. Um, this is not a yeast infection. It was very different than a typical yeast infection, the symptoms. Um, and so I decided, for what is it? You often have to stand up for yourself when it comes to doctors. I, I, I had to do it with a couple of things myself. Yeah, I tell people all the time that you have to be proactive about it. And unless you really push it, I mean, you could sit at home with who knows what. And um, so I, I just had to be proactive about it. And I was like, you know what? I'm being brushed off. I know something's wrong. I know my body more than someone who sees me, you know, twice a year. And um, so I happened to find this specialist, um, Harvard Vanguard in, in Burlington, Massachusetts. And I um, got an appointment. I was fortunate enough that my health insurance at the time um, was accepted there. And so I went in for an appointment. And the first appointment, she was like, you have lichen. And I was like, well, that fucking sucks. <laughs> like I didn't, I didn't really know what to say. I didn't really know what it was <laughs> or, you know, what. And it's definitely um, not something I've ever heard of before. It, yeah. It is very, very rarely discussed. And so, um, you know, I, I just want to say that Harvard Vanguard was amazing. Um, the, I believe it was a nurse practitioner at the time. She no longer works there, but she was just, you know, she was educated and she was comforting. Um, so that was amazing. The experience there is amazing for anyone who goes there for their, um, you know, their vulva care or their OBGYN. But also, okay. um, it was a relief to finally have some kind of diagnosis for what in the hell was happening to my lady bits. Um, that was, you know, it was frustrating to be really young and feel so, and I'm going to use this term because it's how I felt at the time. It's not how I feel now, but, um, I felt so broken. I was like, what in the hell I, I should be able to go out and have all the sex I want and do whatever I want. And why do I have this broken vagina? What in the hell is wrong with me? And I had these really negative, shitty, ugly feelings. Um, I was in a long-term relationship at the time I was diagnosed. And so one of the first things that came to my mind was like, you know, how do I tell my partner? There are a lot of feelings that go through your mind when you get any type of diagnosis for an illness. And um, one of those was kind of denial and, um, and, and so many other feelings. Um, but one of them was relief that I finally had a diagnosis and I wasn't losing my mind um, and that I knew that something was up with my body. And then um, I was in a long-term relationship at the time. And so I began to panic, like, what is my partner going to do? Um, because the, the end of it all is that I may lose my vulva, right? I may lose my ability to have uh, penetrative sex. And how do you explain that to somebody that you're in a long-term relationship with? And so then I began to think, like, um, you know, they have needs as well. And what are they going to need? And I, am I emotionally Lots capable of, of dealing with that? And <laughs> Well, see, and again, in my case, that would be perfectly fine because I'm okay with that. But for right. many women, that's not an option. And exactly. so, um, and so it, it's, it, it kind of, I don't know, there was a lot of things going on. And so um, the doctor was like, well, you have lost 50% of your inner labia to labial flattening. And the first thing that comes to my mind is like, what in the flying fuck? Because I have been seeing two different OBGYNs for the last two fucking years. And you would think that these people who stare at vulvas and vaginas all day would notice that my shit is fucking disappearing. They're so lazy like, fucking <laughs> bitches. I'm like, I don't understand. This is your job. Um, and I understand that the disease in itself is rare. So, so I don't blame them for the misdiagnosis in itself. But I do get angry at the fact that no, no vulva is exactly the same. But there should always be the same general parts and pieces there. So when 
someone says to me, you're missing 50% of your inner labia. And this person has only looked at my vulva one day in their whole entire existence, but yet going repeatedly to the same OBGYNs, you would think that they would be like, hey, you know, your fucking spark plugs are missing or, you you know, (laughs) you blew a gasket or like, (laughs) uh, can I get something here? Yeah. And so that was kind of part of the feelings I was going through. And so, um, I've never been one of those people who gets knocked down for too long. I am a very emotional person. um, And so emotional or emotionally difficult situations knock me on my ass really easily, but they just don't keep me down for too long. And so um, lichen sclerosis was one of those things. I was like, all right, I'm going to get knocked down. I'm sad. I'm hurt. I'm confused. I'm angry. I'm depressed. but now it's time to get back up. I've given myself enough time to deal with it. Um, again, not everybody is going to go through the same emotions. Not everybody is going to be okay with it like I am. Um, so I choose to look at a shitty outcome with a positive view. Like I can't change the outcome of what happens to my vulva, but I can change how I feel about myself and how I look at it. And so originally I was like, oh, I'm broken and, you know, I feel defective and who the hell is going to love me when I can't, um, you know, have vaginal sex or, um, but now I look at it and I'm like, well, I'm, you know, I'm relatively young. And if I want to have other babies, maybe I can have a C-section or, um, you know, if there are other treatments along the way that might come up. Um, the, one of the things that I had spaced out earlier that I just remembered is, um, doctors are trying to figure out how to, um, I guess, regenerate the area or stop the uh, progression of it by stem cell Mm -hmm. therapy. That's one of the new things that's happening right now. And there's an amazing doctor, I believe, in uh, California, Dr. Newman. And his office has has been just amazing at um, just the support and the education and um, the understanding of how it all works. And he's done a lot to bring attention to um, the disease in itself. And so I personally don't know a lot about it on a medical level. That's something that I'm still learning. Um, I I am a sex educator. Um, I understand the basics to how it all works, but I am not a doctor. I am a a person just like all the other folks who have been diagnosed um, or who are yet to be diagnosed. And so I just don't want to sit down and take it. I want to make a difference. I want to make it more comfortable for other folks. And so that's why I decided to put this book together. And the concept of the book is an anthology of different stories um, of other folks who have gone through the diagnosis process. You know, what was it like? Uh, How did you feel? Um, What was, how was your relationship affected? I mean, some women have gotten divorces because of it, because men or, you know, their partners rather, um, are like, hey, we can't have sex and I don't want to deal with your shit or, you know, I can't deal with experiences um, and their struggles. So that way future people who are diagnosed can have this book and go, oh my gosh, I'm not alone. You know, I'm, I'm not alone in this battle. There are other people who've gone through it and have figured it out. Um, and so that way doctors can see what the experience is, because I think a lot of times, you know, doctors see their clients and they can see those particular situations, but they don't see what happens when their clients go home and cry alone for two hours, or they don't see the arguments that uh, are provoked because of their feelings around this disease and how it affects their relationships. Um, they don't see the emotional toll that it takes on people. And so I think that having a book like this is good so that way providers can have insight um, as well as uh, folks who might be diagnosed with it having resources so that way they don't feel so alone. left out, I suppose. Alone, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so, so... So what's the name of the book? So I've kind of put a funny twist to it. So it's called Lichen Sclerosis, Mystery of the Vanishing Vulva. Um, 
I understand that it's not only the vulva that's affected by the disease, but it happens to be my main focus for the time being. Um, and, and that's kind of, you know, people ask me like, what's, what's the outcome? How, what, how does this affect you? And I say, Hey, I have accepted the fact that someday my vulva might just fucking up and vanish. I really have no control over it. Um, there's not much I can do about it. And so, and right now it's just a mystery. How does it get there? What does it do? Um, <laughs> you know, how does the, what does the future look like? Um, and I don't know any of that shit. I don't have the answers to those questions. And so I decided to kind of title it as it is. And plus it gives it some space to grow. So if we want volume two, because there are extra contributions or, you know, future folks want to submit something, that's a possibility. Um, but it's kind of just like, you know, this, this mystery, this journey we're all on trying to figure it out. And, and we're all, we've all become, you know, Inspector Gadget, Inspector Volva Gadget. I don't even know because <laughs> we're all on these, you know, these forums and it's like, hey, I had a flare up because I used this type of detergent today. Have you guys ever used, oh my gosh, yeah, me too. I used this detergent. I had a flare up. Oh, and then we're all kind of, you know, super sleuthing to try and figure it out because no one's going to do this shit for us. Um, you know, and of course, I would love to say, hey, this book's going to be a number one seller and all the um, proceeds will go to research and development. And but I'm really just a person trying to put some, you know, small book together. So that way people have comfort. That's if, if one person reads the book and feels a little bit better about their situation, then that that's, you know, that'll bring me the happiness that I need. That's that's all I'm looking for. I just want people to have a safe space where they can read other people's situations and, and find some comfort. Well, knowing you, I'm going to guess that more than one person is going to find comfort in the book. Um, I, 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 I want to go back for a little bit because I feel okay. like uh, we, we skipped over a topic that I, I'm particularly interested in. And that is how... Uh, in your relationship when you were in, when you got the diagnosis, how did you navigate those waters? How did I? What? Yeah. How did you navigate those waters? So it's, it's really weird when you're in the situation and then when you uh, two years later reflect back on it. So my relationship is no longer existing and it has nothing to do with my LS. It was because my partner and I just had issues. Um, <laughs> and that's me being polite. But um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I went back and I said to them, Hey, I got this diagnosis. And at that point, you know, I have to be honest with you. I don't even think I really understood how it all worked. So I don't know that I could have relayed a lot of great information to my partner. Um, but I knew that my partner had a really high sex drive. That's why we were together because we both did. And so unfortunately I did what a lot of other folks with LS do and have done. And I put myself in really uncomfortable, painful situations in order to please my partner. And I didn't know how, I didn't really understand that I had the ability to say, you know what, I am in pain and this needs to stop and I am uncomfortable and I'm having a flare up today, so I can't have sex. Um, I thought that those were bad feelings and, and shitty things to do. And so um, for a really long time, I just pushed things to do that. I pushed things that my body couldn't tolerate in order to please that human that I was with. And um, I think we've all been guilty of that at one time or another. Yeah, I... I can agree with that. And so the problem is that um, no matter what I would have done, um, wouldn't have changed the outcome of my relationship. Essentially, my partner was cheating on me throughout my whole entire relationship and failed to inform me of that. Um, and so the possibility of opening up my relationship was kind of easy for me because I had always considered it and I am not a super jealous person when it comes to sex. And so the thought when I was going through the process of saying, Hey, you know, if you feel you need to be with someone else, I'm okay with that. I just need your love. Um, and I understand that you have physical needs. I kind of had the discussion with him. Um, but of course he knew what he was doing behind my back and I didn't. <laughs> um, 
And so essentially mm. he, he was already out escapading. And so nothing I could have said would have fixed um, any of that shit. Um, but for me, it was an option just because um, even if I wasn't diagnosed with LS, I was open to open relationships or the concept. And so my next step is like, what the fuck do you do when you're 30 and you're dating with LS? Um, it, it's not a very fun topic to discuss. So, um, yeah, so it kind of just sucks being in the dating scene and having to have this discussion with people because obviously I need to give my partners a heads up just in case we decide to become sexual. They need to know like kind of what my limitations are and aren't. Um, and so usually the first response or reaction that I get when I tell people I have LS is, um, is it contagious? People, <laughs> they think it's, you know, some kind of sexually transmitted disease. Um, and so I have to have that discussion with people. And, and just so we're clear, it's not contagious. Correct. It is not contagious. An autoimmune disease is a disease where your body attacks, um, tissues or organs that are, um, should be there. And so, for example, diabetes is an autoimmune disease because your body attacks your pancreas, even though your pancreas is normal and it should be there. <laughs> so any type of autoimmune disease is your body's reaction to itself and is not contagious. So LS is not contagious now. Okay. We, we talked about what happened with your uh, relationship and you know it was the downfall was not exactly related uh, to LS but how would somebody in who's you know in a long-term relationship and has LS how, do you can you give them like any advice about how they could handle that sex stuff or just the relationship stuff in general um I try to be really supportive of the folks in the groups that I belong to on Facebook, the like in sclerosis groups, um, because a lot of times these conversations come up. And so I think part of it is the fact that society kind of um, has these expectations for vagina owners and their sexuality. So we come into these relationships or these sexual interactions with these preconceived notions of what we should do and what we shouldn't do and how we should behave and how we shouldn't behave. And so the same way that I went into my relationship kind of pushing my body's limits, thinking that it was what I needed to do to please somebody else, um, I have learned that that is not the case. And so a lot of times I like to reassure people that it is totally okay for you to take time for yourself, um, for you to put your body first. For you to say to people, you know what, I just can't do this. Um, I need, I'm having a flare up or I need time to rest or recuperate. Um, again, kind of everybody's bodies progress differently with LS. Um, and so for some folks, if they have gotten to the point of um, where the vaginal opening is really constricted, um, they may have to see their doctors and go through um, a dilator process. And that is something that should be monitor monitored by your provider. And so for some folks, like for myself, even though I have lost um, some of my inner labia, it, it hasn't um, affected my ability to have penetrative sex. And mm -hmm. so, um, but, there are, but there are certain things that cause a flare up and a flare up can be really painful um, the skin gets really fragile. There's a lot of breaking. There's some bleeding. Um, there's a lot of itching and burning. And so I have to be careful with the things that I insert in my vagina. I have to be careful with the types of lubricants that I use um, or whether someone uses their saliva as um, lubricant. Um, so those are kind of discussions that before LS I didn't really have to have with people. Um, and so now I do. And, and I've just... Part of my comfort is that I've become a sex educator and, and that is a beautiful place um, where I kind of found myself and my personal limits and my ability to have these conversations and the language that goes with it. Um, but not everybody has that experience. And so um, part of it is first accepting, you know, your diagnosis and, and giving yourself the emotional time to figure it out because I see so many women are just stuffing their feelings down. Um, and they're not really giving themselves the credit 
Um, the second part is self-love, learning to love your vulva regardless of what it looks like or what you think it should look like is important regardless of whether you have LS or not. And I don't think enough people do it. And so I tell people all the time, like you need to just take a day and spread your legs and put a mirror down and say, you know what, vulva, I see you and you're beautiful. And you know, you might be a little pinker than somebody else's or you might be, you know, your lips one set might be a little longer or, you know, um, whatever the difference is, it doesn't, it doesn't make it ugly. They're all beautiful and they're all unique. And that's what makes it, um, I don't know, so special for me. I'm like, I'm a Volvo fanatic at this point, but, um, <laughs> I mean, is that, that even that's a thing? sort of like old school stuff. I mean, a Volvo fanatic, that sounds like the majority of men on earth. <laughs> well, I I am not a man, but I just I think that women need to learn how to love their bodies more, and um, and so that's that's kind of the primary step. And then from there, you just need to learn um, the language to communicate it to people without freaking them out. Because I do understand that it's it's um, overwhelming for some folks, and especially if you're you know out dating. Um, so so just learning safe language that you're comfortable with. Um, I think that because I'm so comfortable talking to people about it, it doesn't freak people out as much as when I felt shitty about myself. Um, when you reach out to a date and you're like, hey, sorry, we can't fuck tonight because I'm broken, um, they're not as receptive as, <laughs> you know, when you kind of just explain it for what it is and they're like, oh, shit, hey, I'm sorry, you have that. Let me know when you're good to go. Um, and so... From there, it's just kind of listening to your body and learning what your body needs. You have to be very careful what types of lubricants you're using. Um, there are a lot of lubricants on the market because they are not regulated by the FDA. Um, they can have a lot of chemicals that can be really irritating for folks with uh, sensitive vaginas, sensitive vulvas, sensitive skin. Are there any particular chemicals that people should look out for? Um, so one of the ones that are really discussed right now um, – uh, through the sexual education health field um, are parabens. And most um, lubricants do not have parabens anymore. And that was a chemical they put into preserve. I believe you see it a lot in makeup as well. Um, so mm. that's one of the things to look for. The other one is glycerin, and that is a sugar alcohol. Um, so for folks who are um, prone to yeast infections, who have sensitive skin, who are prone to bacterial vaginosis. Um, it is something that can be extra irritating. Um, so when you already suffer from those things, it's important that you stay away from glycerin um, because it can just increase those risks. And of course, it's important to know that when you have any type of vaginal or vulval um, irritation, it leaves you at higher risk for contracting things like HIV um, and other sexually transmitted diseases and infections. So um, that's important to know as well, because if you're having a flare up, um, it, you need to take time for yourself, for your body's purposes, um, but also so that way you can reduce your risks. Now, I, I, I should, I think we should maybe mention that like, if if you're having uh, if you're dealing with LS, maybe checking out something like prep would be very helpful for you. Um, so prep is a new conversation for me. Um, I okay. I I discuss it a lot at work um, because I'm an HIV testing counselor, and so I've been doing this work specifically for about a year. Um, and I, I love the concept of prep, and I think it's amazing. Um, but I never, I never considered that, that, that it could be an option for folks. I, I love prep. I'm on prep myself, like me and my partner are, um, I, it's so far, neither of us have had like any like strong adverse effects. We've been checking with their doctors and I really think people should check it out just so we're clear to everyone. Uh, prep is a daily pill you take to prevent HIV. Correct. Prevent so HIV. to prevent it. Yeah, HIV transmission. Um, right. And so it's become really popular um, with men who have sex with men. Um, and it's you take it daily. You should still take, um, you know, other precautions, uh, safer sex methods, uh, condom use, barrier methods. Um, and so 
Um, cause a lot of times, and, and this is just what I've heard, um, from my own experiences with folks is that they get on prep and they're like, Oh, I can just have sex with everybody now. And, um, so that's not the case. So, uh, prep is amazing, but I think that is such an amazing tool that it should probably have its own show. (laughs) I agree. I'm actually, I actually am going to do a lot, um, a lot of, um, yes. Um, a, a lot of uh, other resources make other blogs on it on prep yeah it's it's becoming really popular right now um and and i hope you know it it, it catches on more in the uh, provider community because a lot of providers don't know what it is or don't know how to react to it don't know how to have those conversations with their clients um and so but again we keep getting off topic prep is amazing but i think it's so special that it should have its own show <laughs> so um I, I I know we talked a bit about like how uh partners who are who are living with uh LS should should or like things that they could do. Is there anything that like the partners can do? Uh the ones who aren't affected by LS, what 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 they can do to maybe support their partner or um uh, make things just a bit easier for them? So I think that is a an amazing question. And I think that the first thing you can do is shut the hell up and listen. It, you just listen. Just just listen to somebody cry about how much it sucks. Listen to your partner tell you that, you know, they feel ashamed or embarrassed that they can't, um, you know, their bodies can't put up with sex um, as frequently as they once could. Um, learn to just be patient and understanding um, and ask the questions. Do a lot of research. Um, I mean, it would be the equivalent of if your partner had some other type of diagnosis that didn't affect their sexuality directly, um, but this still affected their bodies. And so they need time, they need care, they need a lot of love and support. Um, and again, it's it's one of those diseases that does affect you emotionally. Um, I would say similar to the way having breast cancer affects a lot of women and a lot of women feel like they lose their sexuality because we, um, society as a whole sexualizes breasts and it's like, you need bigger boobs and, and, uh, you know, boob jobs and you're not a woman if you don't have a rack. Um, and so it's, it's very similar that a lot of the feelings, um, that women have when they go through double mastectomies and they're like, what the hell do I do now? You know, I don't have boobs. I don't feel sexy. Um, and so they're similar feelings to folks with LS. It's like, what do I do now? Um, I don't feel sexy. I'm, I'm losing some of my sexuality. And I'd so, imagine that, uh, men or people who were contracting HIV would feel a lot of the same way. Like they're losing their sexuality. I know for gay men specifically, that can be a, a big trigger. Yeah, and I'm sure it can be with a lot of other, you know, um, sexually related uh, diseases and infections because there's so much. A, we live in a sex negative country, um, but B, there's so much stigma surrounding anything to to do with your sexuality, um, and so when somebody perceives that in a negative light, um, whether it's having HIV or herpes or having LS, um, it's not something that's talked about a lot. It's not something that is, um, you know, that you can talk about openly with folks. And so um, there there are a lot of underlying emotions that are are similar or linked, um, even though they are different um, diseases. I wanted to mention, uh, I know that a lot of times folks um, in the groups, I talk about sexuality a lot because that's how I feel like LS has affected me. But for a lot of um, women, they're just like, hey, I don't give a shit about having sex. Um, It's really difficult for me to go to work when I have a flare up because it's painful and I can't sit down um, or I can't walk a lot or I can't go on family vacations um, or even urinating is a difficult task for me. And so I just want people to know that, um, I understand that they're 
feelings and struggles are not the same as mine. Um, and I, I want it to be a visible situation for everyone. So um, I just want people to know that it's not necessarily just your sexuality that's affected. But um, many times when I have a flare up, I'm like, how the hell do you tell your boss? Like, how do you call out of work? Um, you know, if you have the sniffles um, or strep throat, you have proof and you can just say to your boss, hey, you know, I have a cold and so I don't want to go in and contaminate other people. But when you have, you know, this raging flare up so bad that you can't sleep for more than 20 minutes that night, um, how do you say that to somebody? Or, or how do you get on disability if your LS is so bad that you can't do a lot of those things? You can't walk a lot. You can't do your job efficiently. Um, People don't really understand how that works. Um, or even, you know, uh, I remember one of the women saying, I went to a, a get together and I explained to somebody that I couldn't have a certain type of food and they wanted to know why I had to be so damn picky. And I didn't want to have the conversation no, with them at. <laughs> Yeah, in my world, um, no, to me, I would just be telling people about my Volvo. Like, I'd be like, well, you asked the question. You should be prepared for all the answers. Um, exactly. And so, you know, but again, not everybody's as comfortable discussing it with, you know, folks as I am. Um, so I'm finding ways to tiptoe around it. But it's it affects people on such various levels. Um, that it's just, I try my best to be as inclusive as possible, um, and, and not just live solely by my experience. Okay. Um, and I, I, I was about to say that, uh, I think that would be a good place to end it. Did you have anything else you wanted to add? Um, we are still accepting submissions for the book. Um, you can visit... Uh, save the vulva dot weebly w e e b l y dot com. Um, there's a lot of information on there. It kind of explains my process. It explains what the process is. If you'd like to, um, if you've been diagnosed with LS and you would like to submit a story, um, I have all types of social media, but I'm a little bit of a hot mess at the moment. So for the most part, if you visit my old podcast website rawsexradio.com there's a lot of my history there um, a lot of older podcasts a lot of blogs that you can kind of get an idea for things and you're always uh -huh. more than welcome to email me Come. um so it, it has been great talking to you alicia i am going to get a new wireless card and a new router before we have you. to before we have to talk again because <laughs> i never i mean never with this crap okay but you know what People, if more Patreon do right, then we wouldn't that. we wouldn't be going through Patreon, this. Um, slash keep it sexy. Awesome. Clear since we're uh, next. I still can't hear you. Correct. It's all <laughs> all right. Let's call this a night. Thank you so much uh, for having me on. All right. Bye. Bye.